This Week on CrossFeed. Would Jesus support Obamacare? Trying to change my religion. Christian colleges and student loans. I'm an atheist. Nope, I'm a Catholic. Bulgaria has the Baptist bones. And an update from New York City. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's edition of CrossFeed News. I'm Dr. Jim Butler, service pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Welcome everyone. On this just previous to the uh, 4th of July. Yep, today is, we are recording this on July 1st. Mm -hmm. So... And hope you all have a, a, a good fourth. What kind of, does your family have any plans? Uh, you know, it, it's sort of tricky because um, we've got the fireworks here are on the third. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a lot of communities around here that don't do fireworks. They just don't, they can't afford it, but ours right, does. Expensive. Yep. Yeah. And so, um, and, and they do a real good show too. You know, people, so people come from the other places too. Um, so it tends to be pretty crowded. And, um, but it's a little tricky for us because I've got kids in the local community theater and they have practice that night. <laughs> At least one of them does. Yeah. And, uh, and they're getting out early, but only like an hour before the fireworks start. And by then, I mean, there's not going to be any parking or anything else like that. So we're still trying to kind of figure out, are we going to go and sort of stake out our spot and then I'll just go and, um, and do the pickup or, you know, or what. And and they moved it this year too. It used to be that uh, it actually wasn't all. It was only a couple blocks from the theater, uh, so it would have just been walking distance and sort of text each other to figure out where we are and stuff. Um, but now they moved it, and it's like a another mm -hmm. mile or two away. So um, that's not going to work. I don't even know where there are fireworks up here. Um, now. Unless you want to go down downtown Boston, but that's crazy. No, so yeah. we're just going to have a big party at my house. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got uh, 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 all, I, I think about every person who's under 40 in my congregation is going to be here. I, I think I, you know, plus a bunch of people I've never met, including one, you know, young whippersnapper pastor from Missouri, you know, supposed to be here, you know, it's a friend of a friend. So it's all showing up. Can you believe they let these guys out at 26 and let them be pastors? <laughs> Can you believe that? I, I, you know, there ought to be a law, you know. They, they ought to be a little older, you know, be able to shave anyway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I've... I've heard about some of the people that have been involved in uh, in the education process for some people and, you know, especially, you know, the, the uh, some of the distance education stuff. And I've had my concerns. So. Never, never trust a preacher under 30, man. That's all there is to it. <laughs> of course, I was only 24 when I got out of seminary. So, you know, it's... Uh, but, yeah. Look at these guys, man. I, I do. I've, well, they're my kids' age now. Uh, Kelly, my da oldest daughter's age, so that makes me feel very old. You were 24? Yeah. Well, we know that it wasn't because you were just unusually bright. So, <laughs> was that just how they did it back then? No, no, no. Uh, I Part of it was just when I started school to begin with. I was young. But then when I was uh, senior year in high school, only one I ha only had one high school class. And all the, est all the others were college. So when I graduated high school, I had a year of college credit. Okay, that helps. Yeah, so that 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 put me another year ahead. So yeah, I started college as a sophomore. I never had a freshman. So people look at me because I talk about yeah, I graduated high school. Then three years later, I graduated college. How did you do that? <laughs> did you go to school all summer? No, I just you know, <laughs> I really never had a senior year in high school. You know, my junior year was really my senior year. Yeah, uh, worked a little different, but it worked. So where should we start? We'll start with our New York City update. Let's yeah. let's go there because uh, okay. we have talked about this story a couple times, um, and we've talked about the fact that in New York City we have there's these churches that worship in these schools. A lot of our mission churches, 
and um, they were being told that this uh, that today today was going to be the end of it. Uh, it was the July first was the deadline. After today, they were going to be you know evicted from the schools and go. Good luck finding a new place to, to worship. Well, this last week, the uh, 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 a court a district court in New York uh, New York area issued a permanent injunction telling the city of New York, nope, you cannot evict these churches. Yep. So that doesn't mean it's over. Um, you know, there's appeals and appeals and appeals. Um, you know, I, it would be interesting to see whether this will go all the way to the Supreme Court. It seems like a ridiculous fight to be fighting. You know, I mean, you know, taxpayer taxpayer money being spent to keep churches out of schools um you know and and appeals aren't cheap and you know i just i don't know it doesn't make sense to me i mean we've talked about it at length and don't need to spend a lot of time talking about it. this is really good news um right, it is for those, tr- those yeah, churches did you notice the next to the last paragraph of the story though new york city which has fought this case for 17 years mm-hmm. but that is one group that is just determined to get their way um and you talk about how much money must have been spent in in this, mm-hmm. um, and we'll see. But I, I, I just, you know, given the certain, certain Supreme Court decisions, particularly like the Lamb decision, I don't see how they have a a leg to stand on. I think they were hoping to drain the churches dry. We're not expecting groups like the Alliance Defense Fund and some others to step in and, yeah, you know, pay pay for the the. You just, I mean, it, it just comes down to the question of what's in the public interest. You know, and and how is it hurting the public to have, uh, you know, churches renting out schools on a Sunday when the place is normally empty? And how is it hurting the public to have rental money coming into the school? Right, exactly. You know, so. So, uh, All right, so that's that one. Let's start then. I guess the big thing this this week, politically, and everything else, was uh, the the, I think the shocking uh, upholding of. the Patient Affordability and Accountability Act, or whatever that thing is called, uh, better known as uh, Obamacare. Um, mm-hmm. And just really was kind of a shock um, because everybody, I think, from the um, questioning of the ju- justice and stuff, thought, was pretty sure it was dead. And uh, so, but it was upheld. And so now, what does this mean? Uh, and we're not only sure we're going to deal. With, we just want to deal really with. I think to me some. Yeah, I thought some interesting issues uh, that came up with this in terms of churches. Uh, okay, it was interesting. Christian Day had an article and talked about you know that evangelicals overall really really lament this. Now it's interesting because again, you know, how do you you know you know highlight this? But uh, uh, evangelical Protestants overall were. Dead set against this. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, black Protestant churches, which tend to be more a bit more mainline. Well, I don't know. It doesn't say black evangelical churches. It, didn't, it just it, says black yeah, Protestant. So yeah. Black Protestant were pretty much uniformly in favor of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and wh- I think the thing that I found most interesting was the Catholics were sort of right split. And, uh, you know, and given the, the amount of, of work that the Roman Catholic Church has done, uh, to fight this because of the HHS mandate, um, boy, you know, it, I, I think it really shows that there's such a divide in the Catholic Church between the um, between the clergy and the laity, um, and and not all laity by any means, um, you know. It, but it seems like there's a there's a real split between people who are, um, you know, sort of like to be sort of eclectic with their Catholic teachings? Well, no, not not really, because originally going into this, you know, um, you know, when, 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 when this was passed originally back in 2009, the Catholic bishops were very much in favor of it, and the Catholic Hospital Association was very much in favor of it. Yeah, they were very supportive. It, you know, a lot of the Catholic bishops are arguing that they were double-crossed by the the Obama administration when the HHS HHS mandate came down, um, 
And this, I think, comes to, again, the, in, 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 the issue. This is one reason why I think churches overall should stay away from political issues, you know, and, you know, not put their money and say, yes, we support, uh, you know, this bill or mm-hmm. we support this thing, this, this idea. Because, you know, obviously nobody, somebody didn't sit down and read 2,700 pages. And find out what, you know, a lot of the thing that says the secretary shall, the secretary shall, the secretary shall. And all of a sudden we're like, well, what, what do you mean? We're going to be asked to, you know, go against our faith. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, to his credit, when, uh, LCMS president Matt Harrison spoke on religious freedom, um, when he was on Capitol Hill, he said some of the Republicans tried to get him into a general denunciation of Obamacare overall and he refused. He said, I don't know anything about healthcare policy. Right. You know, uh, I can only tell you about the religious freedom. That's my issue. I really don't know anything else about. Uh, 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 I we're church body. We have no special insights to. You know what's best for healthcare in America and what's not. Right. Yeah, and that's what you know. We we looked at a couple other um, articles off of the CNN Belief blog. Uh, one's called "The Healthcare Judas Recounts His Conversion." Um, talking about Wendell Potter, who started out as a uh, working for Cigna Healthcare, um, and uh, he was a PR guy for them. And um, and then uh, when he saw people lining up at a fairgrounds to get healthcare by doctors in cattle stalls uh, in America, uh, he was shocked. And and said, "Whoa, this something's not right here." And eventually, he ended up quitting his job, um, which wasn't easy to do, given his six six figure uh, salary with all sorts of benefits. Um, and uh, and you know, and, and he goes around to churches and, and tries to speak on it, and was sort of upset that um, you know he says a lot of pastors are just too afraid to get involved in this and step up and say this is a moral issue. They're afraid of offending their parishioners. All right. Um, you know, here's a, th- and then, uh, on the other side, there's, uh, another article, uh, called Would Jesus Support Healthcare Reform? And, um, you know, here's what it comes down to is, uh, Jesus talked about, uh, us as Christians supporting people, uh, showing compassion. Uh, he didn't say anything about a, a governmental mandate, uh, to show compassion. Um, and, or for that matter, you know, there's the whole question of, is it really compassion when you force people to do it? You know, um, we are to uh, look out for the needs of the orphans and the widows, you know, and, and we see in, in Jesus' life again and again. I mean, it's, it's just constant. He came to be a servant and he calls on us to be servants, too. Um, whether that means that we trust the government to do that um, on our behalf uh, you know, the better question is, what are we doing as individuals about it? Now, right, as, the, if we pardon off the government, we don't have to do it. Right, right, exactly. And, uh, well, that's a bad attitude to have. All right. And so the problem is some people believe that, um, you know what, I, I think the government would, would you know, the, so far we've left it to the individuals and they're not doing it. And so if the individuals aren't going to do it, then we need the government to do it. All right. So that's one side of the argument. The other side is, um, uh, no, uh, we need, uh, you know, that's not the way to do it because the government is uh, notorious about poorly spending money and uh, we need to find another solution that does not um, require us to trust the government to manage it. Right. But I think, you know, there, there's two things. Number one, at heart, this is not a, this is not a church issue. Right. You know, and we always need to be careful of that, that, you know, I think churches should speak theologically. Uh, on Facebook, was, was it you put the note up or one of my other friends on, on Thursday? Uh, no, it was Pastor John Hoey. Uh, I don't know if John even listens out in Ohio, but out in Ohio, who told me he does know you. He has met you. Uh, but, uh, he said, you know, on today, we need to be reminded that we do not speak politically, you know, we, we, you know, that pastors need to be very careful about broadcasting their political beliefs, Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, because they may have churches, people in the church that disagree with them. Uh, Now, on this one guy, uh, uh, Mr. Potter here, who uh, says, you know, he, he 
you know, a lot of these churches don't want um, – a lot of pastors in these churches don't want these people coming in. and they don't, don't want him to come in and talk about this. They're afraid they're going to upset their congregations. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm not – I would – I would not have him come and, quote, speak to my congregation, mm-hmm. unquote. What I would be willing to do is to have him in on a community uh, event that, you know, you know, hear a perspective on health care reform. Right. Right. Because if he's coming, he's coming to talk on a government issue. And Jesus said, give to God what is God's, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Right. And he said, my kingdom is out of this world. Right. So but at the same time, you know, it, this is something that, that we as Christians struggle with. And, and uh, because on the one hand, in the church, um, we're all about compassion and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and grace. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we are citizens not only of, of the kingdom of grace, but of the kingdom of power. That is the, the, um, the government. Um, the you know we're, we're citizens not only of heaven but of uh, in our case the United States of America or, or wherever you are that um, you know where you, your citizenship is we have a worldly citizenship too or earthly um, and, um, and and so those two things while uh, they shouldn't be contradictory um, they have different roles and we have to be very careful that we don't mix those roles I was um I was at the Christian bookstore this weekend, and there were a bunch of um, patriotic T-shirts, and and one of them just uh, really uh, made me just feel sick. And um, it had uh, an American flag and the you know big stars and stripes and a couple of nails sitting on the um, on the flag. Uh, sort of crucifixion kind of nails, and it said, "By his stripes we are healed." But like the stripes on the shirt were the stripes of the flag. And I went, "What message is this sending?" And it really made me uncomfortable. And uh, but and there were a couple other ones that really sort of emphasized something. I've seen a, a number of on Twitter uh, notes from uh, various people, uh, like Ed Stetzer and. Um, uh, Rick Warren, um, making comments about, uh, especially today being the Sunday before the 4th of July, there's a lot of churches, uh, doing sort of patriotic things and, and stuff like that. And, um, an emphasis that, uh, I think it was Rick Warren that said something to the effect of, we, um, we celebrate our nation and, but we worship God. Don't switch that around. Um, right. And that's, yeah. that's extremely important. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, I think it's easy. Well, yeah, I think it's very easy for us to get those two things. Um, I found it, that, that I find the book of Philippians a very good, um, uh, uh, um, uh, counterbalance to that because he's speaking to the Philippians. Philippi, uh, the Philippi was a Roman colony. Most of the people there were retired military. That was a little island of Rome in the middle of Greece. I mean, they worked under Greek Roman laws. They were all Roman citizens. And Paul's reminding them uh, that their citizenship is really in heaven. And, you know, he's really talking about being citizens, you know, in really to, to use Jesus, in the world but not of the world, to be in Rome but not of Rome. And to remember mm-hmm. that they're, where, where are they really citizens? Uh, and I think it's very important for us to, to remember the same thing as well. So, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know where this is all going to come. Uh, the HSS, um, lawsuits are still in effect. Um, and so we'll just have to see where, uh, all this comes down in the future, you know. Uh, but the good thing is the Lord's in charge. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, uh, 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 and we will go from, uh, one way to another. Yeah. Don't put your trust in princes. No, don't. Uh, that's for sure. Um, well, let's go over uh, to 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 Pakistan. This this one, <laughs> you know, it's it's stuff like this that even when when uh, legislation and Supreme Court rulings and stuff like that don't go your way, you could still just be so thankful <laughs> that we do have the government that we do. Uh, you know that we have this 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 wonderful freedom that we do. Yeah, 
Okay, because um, I, I, a couple of things I, I've thought about doing a couple other shows because um, I've been picking the stories lately. I'll just tell everybody. Uh, one of these days, we are going to have the Rainbow Show. I've got all the, the all the all these. You know, <laughs> try to stay from the gay and lesbian stories for a while, but I've got all these all packed up, stocked up, so that we're just going to have a rainbow show one time just to, to do nothing but one topic after another on there. Uh, and the other one, because um, it's very a topic that's near, very near to Dale's heart, I want to do a uh, whole show on uh, persecution around the world. And this is – this is one of them, really. Mm-hmm. This is very religious persecution. Okay, so Pakistan has a very rigid system. They prohibit Muslims from changing their religion on their national ID card. So on your national ID card, it says what you are, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, whatever. And if it says if it says uh, Christian, Jewish, whatever, and you would become Muslim – Hey, we'll change that one. Not a no problem. problem. <laughs> but if it says Muslim and you want to change it to something else, no, that can just about get you killed. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, so there's a man that's named Rana Asif Mahmood. Now, he is a Christian. He always has been a Christian. Never been anything else but Christian. Raised Christian. Baptized in yep. whole nine yards, and he is a politician in Pakistan in the Punjab, and uh, so he uh, is a politician, and he is elected on a minority ballot that there are certain seats set aside for religious minorities, and being Christian, that's him. Well, what happened is, on his ID card, the National Database and Registration Authority accidentally put him down as Muslim. Now, he contacted them and said, no, I'm Christian. Don't put me down as Muslim. And they said, they said, no. (laughs) They refused to correct it. Why? Because you can't change for Muslim. Um, and he says it's just, you know, his, his son has a computer, you know, his son's getting in trouble on his card because, you know, he says, I'm Christian. You can't put down Christian. Your father's Muslim. I don't know. My father's not Muslim. And it's causing him a great deal of trouble. It also cost him a cabinet position and proposing uh, the national budget. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. All well, over oddly the though, players. his passport says he's Christian. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th- and this is one of those things that it's, I mean, really, it's it's so bizarre and it sounds like something you'd see on an episode of like The Office or something or, or like a Dilbert comic, you know, this this, this is like Pakistani Dilbert right here. I've myself. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's it's this goofy clerical error kind of thing, but it's led, I mean, for this person and, and his family it's it's caused untold grief and so you know it's it i i bet it's just so bizarre from our perspective that it makes me chuckle all right but at the same time i have to say my heart goes out to this guy and i feel so bad for him and it's not i mean I, i'm i'm laughing at the situation not at the guy i, I feel terrible for him uh it's just the you know the the ridiculousness of the government um, well, I, I, I just love this, actually. A NADRA, this is National Database Group uh, official who wanted to remain anonymous, says um, if the computerized ID card recipient provided evidence of religion and established that there had been a clerical error, that request to change would be entertained. But a clerical error is highly unlikely, he said. <laughs> Data is cross-checked several times in cases of identity card entries. Uh, he said one person applied for an ID card and the personal information was recorded. They were sent a form of attestation. At that stage, the applicant could report any errors, which is exactly what Mamu did to no effect. Yeah, I just love this. A clerical error is highly unlikely. This is like a bureaucrat. I mean, seriously. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, um, I, I remember one episode of Star Trek, Dr. McCoy said, you know, the bureaucratic mindset is the only constant in the universe. <laughs> See, this reminds me of, uh, we were having, uh, we just switched away from um, Time Warner Cable not too long ago, and um, we, we were having the problem that our in our guide, the channels would, it would say that, you know, this channel is this, or this number is this network, and, you know, and stuff, and, and that corresponded with uh, the list on the website of what was supposed to be what, but when you go to that channel, it actually wouldn't be that. So you go to like, um, you know, Discovery Channel and you give VH1 or something like that. And, and so the guy didn't match up, which made it impossible to record anything on our DVR. And, and you constantly had to go, okay, what channel? You know, it was just, it was crazy. And, and so I contacted their tech support and, and they basically insisted that, no, the, this, these are what the channels are. And, um, you know, and, and, and it, they're essentially telling me that it was impossible that they were mixed You're up. You are obviously too stupid to own a television. That's, <laughs> yeah. that, that's what they're telling you. Yeah, basically, yes. you know, like, you know, you know, and, and I mean, I, I, I got so tired of jumping through hoops. That was one of the reasons that we said, forget it. We're, I mean, we were, it came down to, we were debating between just going to an antenna, uh, or satellite <laughs> and, and, um, it, it came down to the kind of TV that we ended up getting um was the reason that we went with satellite but i mean we were ready to just say forget it we'll just put a you know antenna on the roof and be done with it you know, you know it's, yeah I, so i uh, my heart goes out to this guy i i hope the bureaucrats out there get things straightened out but um it's, it's crazy just to think no you're i'm sorry you're not allowed to change what you believe that's right. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that's incredible in itself. But, but it's not what it changed what he believes. It's a change of the ID, which, cause this guy screwed it up. I mean, it's even worse that, you know, right. than that. He didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about something that's more positive. Maybe some bureaucrats are doing. Uh, and that is, um, Christian colleges. One of the, one of the issues, um, of course, obviously is, you know, higher education is the, uh, student loan debt. Mm-hmm. Now, this week, Congress uh, voted to uh, keep student loan rates at 3.4%, which is artificially low. And it was interesting. It was only down a few years ago basically to buy votes. So they kept it artificially low to continue buying votes. I mean, that's that's the only reason this is done. Uh, but anyway, they've done it for one year. That way it can raise next year when they don't have an election to worry about. <laughs> uh, and then they can reduce it the year after that to buy votes again. But that's another story. But – Anyway, it, it seems that there is a uh, company. Now, now, of course, Christian colleges are, are all private, so they are all a little bit more expensive than state places. And uh, it said here the story uh, about a company called LRAP. Uh, it doesn't say what that means. That uh, serves mostly Christian schools, and it helps the students pay their student loans. Because one of the issues, of course, for, for a lot of these students – uh, that they deal with the Christian colleges, they go into Christian ministries, whether that be uh, uh, youth ministry or um, you know those types of things, and they pay rather low. I don't mm-hmm. know if you noticed that deal. You know, we're not in this for the money. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, but, you know, and also or pastors your and, and yeah. other church professionals, it helps them then be able to to to, to work on their student loans. I wish this article had a little bit more. Information exactly how the program worked. I, that that I was never quite figured out with. Figured it out how it went to. Yeah. Because it said they can actually get reimbursement checks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't quite get it, but I mean, it's it's good news, and I, I would say that anybody that's going into um uh, some sort of a ministry occupation, um, you know, a major, you definitely want to look into this. L R A P. Um, but no, I mean, this is a huge issue. Uh, it's a huge issue and, and different places have tried to deal with it. I mean, we, in the Missouri Synod, uh, we have to, um, unless you're Jim, uh, you have four years of, of undergrad and then, uh, four years of seminary and, um, boy, you know what? Seminary is expensive, uh, just as expensive as college and, um, and then you, you add all that up, and most people, by the time they have a master's degree, uh, you know, they're 
they can generally find a job that pays uh, like a master's degree pays. Uh, not so with pastors. Uh, pastors tend to get um, paid. I know our the way our scale works is um, that's based on the it's an adjustment from the local uh, elementary teacher's salary or something like that. Um, it's calculated based on that. And so, like, in, in North Ridgeville, uh, it's lower than some of the surrounding areas, you know. But but then again, also, um, churches can't always pay scale either, as much as they want to. Um, and so it depends a lot on the church. But Generally, the only people I know for sure who pay scale is the district office. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 rare. Or if the district church is subsidized by the district, they have to pay scale. But otherwise, there's no guarantee you're going to get scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's purely a recommendation. And, I mean, like I said, churches, they want to pay it, right? But at the same time, uh, there's other expenses to consider. Yeah, my uh, my first church, I remember the, the, the my pay, rate of pay, we won't even talk about it. It was pretty laughable. Um, I don't know how they expected somebody to live on it. Actually, I think my first church, somebody told me, my wife and I would have, would have, would have qualified for food stamps. Because our, our pay was so low. You know, on the other hand, there are other government programs that help out. Um, if you... There's one that I don't totally understand, uh, where it's it's supposed to be that the government, if, if you're... If your income compared to your... There's a, like a ratio between your income and your... Um, and and your your amount of debt, so it's like the government's supposed to make the payments for you. Oh, that's what I thought it was, but then I found out it's it's not. It's more like a deferment. Um, but if you are able to make regular payments for ten years, if you, and you work for a nonprofit, not just churches, but churches are included in this, ten years of regular payments, and I don't know, you know, how they set the minimum on that. Um, you have to work that out with the government or whoever your loan provider is. Um, then you can get debt forgiveness, and and they'll wipe clean the rest. Um, so you know there is help out there. Uh, you got to find it though. But um, but it's there. Okay, LRAP is Loan Repayment Assistance Program. It is a it is a foundation it's set up to help uh, the students pay off their uh, loans. Uh, it is a reimbursement. Um, they make certain uh, 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 reimbursements back to the students to help them uh, pay back their 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 money. Okay. So. It's kind of an interesting thing. By the way, even, you know, traditionally the church's body like the Assembly of God, you know, didn't have seminary educated pastors and now they're beginning to and they're beginning to feel the pinch for that too. Uh I mean, uh places like uh, Fuller, Gordon Conwell, Trinity Divinity School, those places are you know, they're not much cheaper any place else. Mm-hmm. So um okay. Speak politically here for a second. I, I'm waiting for the higher education bubble to pop. You can't keep paying cost charging more and more and having students go deeper and deeper into debt. Mm-hmm. Somewhere along the line, people are just going to sit back and go, I can't pay this. And that's going to be it. So it's yeah. going to be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, because salaries aren't really going up comparatively. The more uh, uh, degrees are required – or it used to be you could get a decent job with a high school education and you went to college if you wanted to get a really good job or a, a specialist uh, sort of mm-hmm. position. Um, nowadays, even a, a associate's degree is, um, uh, except for in a handful of fields, it's pretty hard to find something. So, um, And in an a ongoing recession, uh, it's just that much tougher. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it, it's really sort of a catch-22. Well, I don't know. I haven't seen a an associate's degree in uh, 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 being uh, an electrician 
or assistant or associate's degree in car mechanics, I mean, uh, or carpentry. Seriously, there's a lot of trades out there, people, that, that, or I'll tell you, up here, I was talking to a guy, and there's a desperate need for machinists. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, no, there's they, definitely they skilled labor you know, um, kind of positions that yeah. where they're really looking for people. You know, there's a lot of places where they're looking, but they're just, you know, stuff. Anyway, uh, onward here. Uh, let's go to Bulgaria, and then we'll deal with the, the Catholic lady here. Okay. This is a weird story. <laughs> it's, in a lot of ways, it's sort of a non-story, but it, the whole thing has always disturbed me. Um, we've got a, uh, a Bulgarian archaeologist uh, announced two years ago they'd found the bones of John the Baptist. Um, now, they've done uh, uh, carbon dating on it and, uh, and DNA scanning, and they've figured out that this was... Uh, th- these are the bones of a man who lived in the Middle East at the same time as Jesus. All right. Now, they like said we don't have a uh, DNA database on the um, on people from the Bible, so it's not like they can really you know double check to see if it's John the Baptist. But um, the important thing is here is it's not a fake uh, in the sense that a lot of the relics. Uh, that are floating around are date from the Middle Ages. Hmm. Yeah. And, and but I like this. Frauds. It's kind of funny. Uh, and so the bones are in a reliquary uh, in a tiny sandstone box. And right on the box, in Greek, were the words, God, save your servant Thomas, to St. John, June 24th. The date is the Christian face, feast day of John the Baptist, believed to be his birthday. No, it's that John is believed to be born six months before Jesus, and you know that's. <laughs> it didn't even click. <laughs> you know, because you know when G- Mary finds out she's pregnant, Elizabeth's in her six months. So you go three months, and that's John's, you know, birthday. But. We don't know when Jesus was really born, and so we don't know when John was really born. Yes, <laughs> June twenty fourth is the festival of Saint P- of Saint John, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't know when that was made a festival. I don't, you know. Well, it's it's more tied with the church calendar than the you know right. the actual calendar, because yeah, we celebrate Jesus' birth uh, at the end of December, but. That has nothing to do with when he was actually born. It was they were trying to draw attention away from the winter solstice. So, um, <laughs> but and and actually, uh, since shepherds aren't out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night in December, uh, we can be pretty confident that he wasn't born in December. <laughs> so, but me, you know, so that's kind of a strange part to, to bring up in this. But anyway, um. But the interesting part is that, you know, they did find this thing and they have bones at least to be from, from the right era. It may or may not be. Uh, right. you know. So there's another church that has his skull, um, supposedly, and another one that has, what, his right arm? Um, mm-hmm. and, and so, the, you know, they get these together, they, they check them all. They could at least see if there's a DNA match among the various bones to see if these are all from the same guy. I mean, yes. none of us ever going to prove that it's actually John the Baptist. Um, I just remembered Luther's comments that Jesus had 12 disciples, 20 of whom were buried in Germany. <laughs> you know, I mean. Yeah. I, I guess the thing that really disturbs me about this, okay, there's a lot of things that disturb me about relics, okay? Um you know, like the whole idea that God will like you better if you um, if you pray to pieces of dead people. Um, sort of makes you want to just like walk into certain parts of the Vatican and say, I see dead people. Um, but... Is I it, so uh, have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, like... I do, so have to do that one of these days. Do, do, do you find it just a little disturbing that, you know, Christians normally bury their dead? Um, like, 
unless you're an exemplary Christian, they were going to cut you up into pieces and s- distribute you all over the world so that people could pray to your parts. Man, um, I oh, that's just wrong. I've got to do that someday. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for. Oh man, that's cool. Great. <laughs> all right. Well, as long as we're talking about Catholics and you know knocking the Vatican here. Um, <laughs> This was an interesting. Uh, there is a um, woman, name is uh, Le- Leah Labrusco, and she uh, blogs at Patheus, and for a long time has said that she's an atheist. I mean, that's just been it. She's you know, uh, uh, you know, an atheist, and uh, then. She just shocked recently her uh, 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 the the atheist blog community there by saying, um, "I'm no longer an atheist. I have converted to Christianity." Uh, she said uh, because of her struggles with the roots of moral law, and which she, she said, finally says aligns with a Christ-centered worldview. She said, "I believe that the moral law wasn't just a plasant of Platonic truth, abstract and distant." It turns out I actually believed it was some kind of person, as well as truth. And there was one religion that seemed like the most promising way to reach back into that living truth. And um, so specifically, not just Christianity, but Roman Catholicism. Right. But interesting, through liturgy, of all things, I asked my friend what he suggests we do, because they, they wanted to reach back to this living truth. And we prayed the night office of the Liturgy of the Hours together. And I've been doing that ever since. This would be a night to remember. Is that complete? Uh, I might be, might might be, might be another one. But uh, I just thought that was interesting. That you know they they, well, it could be that each of the liturgy of the hours, uh, terse, sext, uh, mm. the whole nine yards. But I just found that that was very interesting. That you know, be, you know, <laughs> how do I reach this truth? And she does it in this liturgical. You know, that's something I've, I've been doing a lot of reading and, and especially, you know, if you look at the picture of her, I don't know how old she is, but, um, she's not super old. No, she's um, somewhere in her maybe late twenties, early thirties, I would yeah. guess. All right. So that generation, um, there's a, a renewed interest in, uh, sort of the ancient. Um, uh, there's a recognition that, that God is mysterious and, um, and so we shouldn't expect to find him in um, pop culture. And and so there's a, a sort of a kickback against, um, uh, you know, contemporary worship and things like that, and, and going, uh, but not and some somewhat to sort of um, more of a, a formal or ancient liturgical practice, uh, but other times to uh, other with like. Taize and and um, uh, some of the I might be pronouncing that wrong. Um, some of the more or the uh, walk in the labyrinth um, stuff like that, uh, where it's it, um, more of a you know focus where you sort of sit in silence and and, and things like that, um, and you kind of walk away with this sense of um, of sort of mystery and um, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Right. So, um, but I thought it was really interesting. Uh, she says she she struggles with some aspects. Um, the church is teaching on homosexuality, but she's going to explore them. You know, but I think it's interesting that uh, we've often said there. You know, the the, the church, the the you know the two great proofs of God, are cosmology, and conscience. Mm-hmm. And here is the proof of God by conscience. You know, right. there's, you know, why, why is there right and wrong? What is the great, you know, here it is. There, there's, there's got to be something here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I've, I've talked to atheists about that question. And, um, and basically the, the best answer I've got as far as the whole good and evil question is, um, I just make it up as I go along. I, I pick and choose for myself. It's sort of a postmodernism kind of thing. But the problem is, is, is as much as you say that, um, you know, all you got to do is say, well, what about Hitler? Oh, well, he was wrong. <laughs> you know, well, who are you to Why? say that? You know, right. Yeah, who are you to say that? 
Right. You know, and, that's, that, you that, know. yeah. Or, you know, there, there's, uh, 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 interesting enough, uh, I came across it, um, from a guy, since we started off with healthcare, but he, he saw how, you know, he thought it was great injustice being done in our world. Uh, and, you know, seeing a bunch of people going hungry, a bunch of people without health care, things like that, and saying, this is wrong. There's got to be, you know, they they got to answer to someone for this. Mm-hmm. And right. then if I believe they have to answer to someone, I believe God must exist. Yeah. Yeah. You because know, who else can they answer to? So, but I thought this was an interesting uh, article, and I pray that Leah continues uh, her her stuff to do. Uh, you know, she said this isn't the, the her final post on the atheist blog. That this isn't the final word on my conversion. I'm sure there's a lot more explaining and arguing to do, um, but she's going to try and do her best. You know, I, I really appreciated this bit about um, the homosexuality, and I'm going to explore it, right? And and we've talked about this before, but um, the church is a good place to explore that stuff because we're talking about it and, and we're looking at. Um, at why we believe what we believe. And, and it should be, if your church is not a safe place to explore that, if it's sort of, you're not allowed to ask those kind of questions or express those kind of ideas, um, you know, then reform your church. Okay. Don't leave it, reform it. Right. But, um, because we need to, we need to be able to explore this stuff. I mean, that's how the church got where it is today. That's how we got our creeds. That's how we got um, our various confessional statements, uh, depending on what your um, what your uh, uh, your your particular um, uh, background is, or um, your your faith tradition is. Um, it's from debating and 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 exploring these issues and saying, you know, why do we believe what we believe and what does Scripture say and why does it say it and you know and and getting to know God better and um and and you know more and more seeing things through God's eyes. And, Excuse um, me, I tell my people stop thinking when they walk in the door. Let me do the thinking for them. <laughs> Check your brain at the door. <laughs> That's right. On to something else. We got the email this week from uh, our friend George, and uh, he was talking about uh, – we had commented about union churches. And he said, yes, there were quite a few union churches there in uh, Pennsylvania. They drove him a little bit crazy. He said, uh, you know, they used uh, reform Sunday school materials, and uh, um, and they, they, they t- caused a lot of problems. Um, um, and they, 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 they had a lot of different, uh, uh, peculiarities. Then we talked, I don't know how we got into the subject on ELCA seminaries, but he said, um, uh, um, and I thought this was interesting because we talked about higher education. And I, I really want to get in this paragraph. He said, talking about Franklin Clark Fry, who was uh, president of the, uh, LCA at one point and president of, um, Lutheran Theological Seminary in uh, Philadelphia. Anyway, he says this about President Fry. He tried to bring about many churches changes within the church. First, he felt the church ought to be run like a business to be more efficient. Second, he wanted to cons- consolidate the seminaries with only five located in strategic locations throughout the United States and within a university setting. That pretty much happened. Uh, matter of fact, the most recent one is in uh, Columbia, where... Um, Lutheran Theological Seminary of the South is merging with uh, the or Rhine College. But not in Pennsylvania. They tried to merge the two seminaries, Gettysburg and Mount Airy, uh, L- Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. We had a joint seminary president for the two seminaries when I was there, but he had a serious heart attack. Gettysburg went to a big comp- building campaign. The merger failed. The United States seems that education above high school has become big, very profitable business and run by business people. Much to my regret, I think the ELCA has jumped on the same bag wagon with the seminaries like a business for profit. It's a very expensive endeavor to prepare for this ministry these days, leaving them with a big debt to repay for student loans. I think the ecumenical addition is part of the big business ma- model. Get on. I, I, I think he's really very much correct in a lot of that. I really do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, of course, I don't know how you couldn't really get those two seminaries to merge. Um, 
you know, considering the kind of historic rivalry, because Gettysburg was formed first, uh, but then in a uh, the, the the seminary split, and um, they formed uh, the seminary in Philadelphia then, uh, and it went back to what was called in um, Gettysburg the the general uh, general synod, which is one of the oldest uh, uh, organization Lutheran organization in the United States, which started up the, the Gettysburg Seminary, and they split and um, formed um, was called the General Council that formed the school at Philadelphia. Um, if I recall right, and George, I'm sure you'll correct me, it was over the teaching of a guy at Gettysburg named Sa- uh, Simon Schmucker, who uh, wrote a um, declaration which – for Lutherans in America, which basically denied anything that was specifically Lutheran. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, and was uh, responded to by uh, the Krauths, Charles Porterfield Krauth and Charles Philip Krauth. Can't remember which was the father, which was the son. Uh, but that formed the General Council. And they stayed separate until. 1919, when they and the United Synod of the South remerged into what was then called the United Lutheran Church in America. I did not know that. So, a little bit of Lutheran history there for you. Oh, very nice, Blaine. I never got that. I, no, I'm, t- I'm trying to find the note. I never... Oh, you're trying to find it. You never got I, it. Oh, okay. I, I wonder if my spam filter grabbed it or something. My, yeah, it could be. You know, I use Gmail, but lately, there's been way too many false positives in the spam filter, and I'm not mm. sure why. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to dig through my email to see if I can find it. Ah. I can't. So, Oh, well, I'll, I'll look for it, because I'm, I'm interested to read the, me- the note now. <laughs> so, strange. But, uh, George, you do appreciate um, the feedback and, and from everybody else. Uh, appreciate everybody listening, watching. And, um, and, uh, I, I did get the episode out, um, uh, <clears throat> like a couple hours ago. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get these out, you know, as, as much as possible. But, uh, but you need to be patient with us. We, we are both busy pastors. So, yeah. And Dale's even busier with his family and stuff, so. Uh, so, um, but, you know, it's a joy and, and, uh, really appreciate everybody. Just, you know, keep the feedback coming. You can email us at podcast or uh, or if you're using a, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or something like that, um, you feel free to leave comments there or on our Facebook page, uh, or, uh, or you can just, um, if it, we'd love it if you'd go over to iTunes podcast directory and uh, leave a review there. That'd be awesome. Hey, kids, that's enough for one night, eh? So, so take care. Have a wonderful Fourth of July, everyone. And we will be seeing you next week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless. Mm-hmm.